I'm Duncan McLeod. Welcome to episode two of Meet the CIO, the new monthly show from Tech Central, where we talk not to technology vendors, but rather to the end users of IT, the big banks, retailers, manufacturers, and other companies about how they're using modern technology to power their businesses. Meet the CIO is proudly presented by Wipro, and we thank the team at Wipro for helping bring you this exciting interview series. You can learn more about Wipro at wipro.com. Now, our second ever guest on Meet the CIO is Shabana Teva. Shabana is Chief Information Officer at Investec. Shabana, thanks for making the time and welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Fantastic. Shabana, tell me a bit about yourself. Um, you've been with Investec, I think, according to your LinkedIn profile, since about 2008. Yes. Uh, but you started your career as a software developer, I think for Smart Call, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. What, what, were you, what language were you coding in? Well, back then I was coding in .NET. Today I don't code anymore, mm -hmm. so um, I do miss it. But I think there's a bit of a story behind how I got into software development, and okay. it's a very simple story. I was, in 1996, I was actually um, choosing my subjects for high school. Um, I am giving away my age, but that's okay. Younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> so I was choosing my subjects, and mm -hmm. I went home and I spoke to my dad, and I was like, Dad, I want to do computer science. Right? So it's S7, um, English, Afrikaans, mathematics, biophysics, and I want to do computer science. And my dad was just like, okay, let's talk about this. Uh, shouldn't you be doing accounting? And uh, then I said, no, I want to do computer science. And my dad's only ask was that he wanted me to be an independent woman. Mm -hmm. um, he grew up in tough times, and that's all he ever wanted for his children, and not have any reliance. So he supported the, con he supported the conversation. I did computer science in high school. I did a BSc in comp science in university. I did an honors cum laude in university. I tried to find, I tried to find a job, couldn't really get a job, even though I had a cum laude in honors. And then I decided, you know what, I've got to ship out of Durban and I've got to go to Johannesburg and do my master's in AI. That was very short-lived. Okay. Uh, it was three months. I had a car in load. A in AI, when, when, what year was this? This was uh, 2005. Okay. Yeah, so 2005, um, I started the master's. I was doing research on natural language. Three months in, I was just like, I've got to, I've got to pay for my car. Mm -hmm. I've got to pay for my student loan. I needed a little bit more money than a research assistant and doing my master's in AI. And I lost, like I wanted to go back at software development. I mean, I used to code at night. No coffee, no Barocca. I didn't even know what it was. And then I've, I started at Smart Call thereafter as a software okay. developer, as a .NET software developer. We had Bruce Paveley from the CIO of Time Bank on, on episode one of the show. And uh, he told us about how he, he uh, got into computers when he was a young kid. When his dad bought him a ZX81 computer, which he learned to code on. Do you have a similar story? Did you have a computer at home that you learned to program? So I didn't. I only got exposed during high school, okay. and then my dad uh, saved up uh, uh, across the years, and then bought us a computer at home. So then I used to code on that. Okay. What was uh, that? A PC or? Uh, that was a PC. Mm -hmm. That was like a floppy disk kind of approach, and like, uh, yeah, I'm not a hardware person. It was just give me the software, I'll write the code. Okay. I will show you that it works. <laughs> <laughs> And then I, I mean, I, I can't. And it was then that you realized you have a passion for this. I actually subject. only, I did not get the computer before I started software development. It oh, was wow. after. Oh, wow. My maths teacher just sat us down and um, she said uh, computer science was just introduced in our high, high school. So yeah. we went to a public school in Verulam, a very small town. And I she know said, mm. yeah. Mm. And then she said, she sat us down, a couple of students, and she says, you're good in mathematics, we've got a comp science lab. Why don't you take computer science? And um, she took us to the lab and she showed us this coding and the stuff you could do on it and this hello world. And I was like, mm, this looks pretty cool. And that's how I fell in love with it. Okay. And then my dad allowed me to choose it, even though he wanted me to go into accounting um, and never looked back since then. So did you start programming in .NET? Or? No, I studied in Java. Java. Um, okay. So I had to learn the fundam fundamentals. So I did C++, uh, Java, object-oriented programming. Um, at high school, I did Pascal. I did all the fundamentals behind everything that I'm supposed to do. Um, and that's how my career started. Okay. Um, I finished university on Java. My honors was, um, uh, my honors project was a voice-activated banking system. So it was actually using IBM's technology where I programmed it to be able to be a voice-activated system. Um, but I, I then moved into the world as a .NET developer. 
Okay. Um, so I didn't. I left, let go of Java, and then I went in and dot, did dot .NET at SmartCall. Okay. Yes. SmartCall. SmartCall is a cellular service provider. Yes, it's the Vodacom service provider. That's right. Yes. SmartCall Cellular. Yes. Yeah, I'd, I'd forgotten about them. They're not things. around anymore. Uh, they're still around. Oh, they're still around. Okay. Yes, they're still okay. around. Uh, but I did many things there as a developer, mm. BI, BI developer, software developer. I used to do support. I used to fix the printers. Okay. okay. Um, there's, there was DBA, uh, many things. Okay. Overnight support. Okay. The works. Okay. <laughs> okay. And uh, you were there for about four years. Yes. Uh, and then you joined Investec. Yes. How did that opportunity come along and what was your first role at the bank? Um, so uh, it's a funny story. Um, I never understood what it meant when I was younger that um, people leave leaders. And at SmartCall, my leader left to start his own company called mm -hmm. Flixwitch. His name was Keir Snyder. I know Flixwitch, okay. Yes, yeah, yeah. so small. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I really looked up to Keir. He, he gave me opportunities. He built me up. He, I mean, I studied my MCSD uh, when I was at uh, SmartCall as well. And he left uh, to start Flixwitch. And then I just found it easier. I just said, you know what, I need to get back into the... Like, go back into the market. I knew some people at Investec. Mm -hmm. Um... They spoke about this premiumness. I didn't know anything about the culture. Um, and then I loved to wear suits. Okay. So I was just like, you know what? Join let me bank. apply. Yeah, I was like, let me apply. But I applied to many companies. Um, I managed to get in as a software developer and join the Dazzle of Zebras in 2008. Okay. Yes. In, in what capacity? I was a software developer. Okay. I started in the CIB business, mm -hmm. uh, corporate and uh, institutional banking space. Mm -hmm. I was there for seven and a half years. Did coding again in .NET, um, took on multiple roles as well. So I was a software developer, I was a solutions architect, I was a BI lead, I was a testing lead. Um, I think I mentioned I was a solutions architect. I moved around the bank as well as the head of risk, head of central services, head of private banking, uh, tech. Uh -huh. All in the tech space, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I got good exposure all over, and also more than one role at a time. So it gave me a lot of stretch, a lot of growth, um, and then today I'm the CIO for Specialist okay. Bank South Africa. Okay, great. What do you see of, as the role of a, a CIO in a modern organization like Investec? I mean, what, what, is, what does your day-to-day -day job entail, and what do you see as the most important role of a CIO in an organization like, like a bank? Um, so let me start off by saying that, you know, a CIO can't be one dimensional. So it's not all about technology. And I think it's important to be able to come in with a different lens. You know, when I went and did my executive program at, um, at Harvard, I walked in as a technologist, but I walked out as a business leader. Mm -hmm. So having a view and a perspective, not just of technology, how to innovate, how to put in new business models, how to change, but also have a lens of risk have a lens of commerciality, have a lens of operations, have a lens of compliance, what all of that means in conjunction with each other. And as a technologist, we always talk about T-shaped people. Well, the bottom of the T is my, is my technology experience, but the top of the T has to be many things from risk to finance to many other things, strategy, all of those things become really, really important. And having that full view as a CIO, I think is really, really, really important in our roles. I think being in the financial services industry is already a demand in itself. It is, uh, I mean, it, uh, the reality is that it allows for capital and liquidity movement. It's a money movement for trade, investment, businesses, organization. It's the building of wealth. And I think it's, it, well, from a GDP perspective, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's about 15% of the contributor to GDP. So it runs, it's, the, it's you know, it's part of the national economy. Mm -hmm. If it fails, the economy fails, as an example. So we see ourselves as very systemic in this, in this environment. So holding that role in the, as a CIO in the financial sector is really important. That's why risk becomes important while you're innovating at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think working towards your question around the fact that, you know, the, the modern piece, there's a lot of technology that advances. And people keep saying, you know what, the buzzwords around artificial intelligence, what's happening there, cloud, what's happening there. But having a holistic approach in terms of your role is critically important mm -hmm. whenever you're putting any technology change in place. Um, I think keeping up with it is very hard, and I think it will continue to be hard because it's just changing at a fast pace. Mm -hmm. But there's many opportunities at the same time, despite the challenges that you face, you just need to know how to approach it. Are there, are there specific things that um, a bank CIO has to do 
that a CIO in a different organisation, another industry, doesn't? Um, are there specific pressures? Are there specific? Um, I'm not sure what word I'm looking for. Are there specific uh, issues that a that a bank CIO has to deal yes. with that another industry doesn't? Well, I guess if you look at the context of the business and because it's money movement, you have mm. to consider many things. So depending on the business that you are in, the role has to consider the risks and the opportunities as part of that. So let's swap into a different industry, right? So let's take the health industry. The, the business is about saving lives. Mm. So the technology you put in has to be able to fulfill that purpose of saving lives. And that return of investment has to be connected to that. Now, if I pull us back into the financial services industry and, and I look at my role in the context of the economy and the movement of money and, you know, trading and investing and wealth management, et cetera, all of that pieces, I have to look in that context. And, but I do think there's an important aspect around the purpose of the organization. And um, how do you unfold that purpose is really important. If uh, the health industry's purpose is about saving lives, uh, our purpose at Investec specifically is centered around creating enduring worth. So moving away from shareholder value to um, stakeholder value. So look at all the stakeholders in the value chain and fulfill that purpose whenever you put change in. I don't think, I think you have different risks and different opportunities in each of the industries. And it does depend on the purpose of the organization around how you do things. Mm -hmm. Because you can put technology in anywhere, in any industry, but you always have to center yourself back to the purpose of what you are doing. So in our case, how do we take a technology change into our environment, considering the fact that our stakeholders are not just our clients, our clients, our employees, our society, our, um, our regulator, as an example, you know, when we're putting in a change of AI, I have to consider that I abide by the policies. Mm. I can innovate for the client, absolutely, and I can give them the world's class experience. But am I, you know, abiding by the, the policy of privacy, as an example, from the regulator side and of things? It's a very regulated industry. Absolutely regulated. It has to be. It's tight controlled. Mm. Am mm. I managing fraud effectively as I should be, knowing that AI can actually predict some of these things and falsely predict some of these things, mm -hmm. but also positively pr predict some of these things? How am I managing that? Mm -hmm. and what does it mean for the society as well? Um, we know that carbon footprint is high on some of these technologies like blockchain and you've got green tech, uh, many things like that. But what is the right thing in the context of the country that we are living in together with the context of the organization that we are also participating in? And how does that roll up to the purpose? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think is important. For sure. What in your view makes uh, what qualities make a good CIO in your view? Um, what, um, what do you need uh, to be an effective leader in IT? Um, so I think that I'll go back to the fact that you need to be very well-rounded um, in your approach and your thinking. Um, I speak about the fact that you need to understand commerciality, risk, strategy, um, technology, many aspects that you have to take in making your decision. I think there's a large part of a, of a CIO needs to be very much as a, as a beacon, so being a visionary, mm -hmm. being able to articulate that vision is critically important because you have to enroll people in that vision. And um, you, you are the beacon, great, but you also have to be the architect. So yes, you have this beautiful vision, but if you look at architecting your organization into achieving that vision, we very much centered around culture and people. So you've got to take this triangle of people, culture, and the organizational hardware, and you've got, to, you've got to look at that in conjunction with each other and where the push and pulls are. So, for example, because I don't want to talk theoretical, for example, if you're going to put an AI change, in, like I'm, I'm talking a lot about AI because, I mean, that's relevant right now. Sure. But, I mean, if you want to put in an AI change in place, what does it mean for the organization from the people perspective? Like, you want to put in... Um, co-pilot in order to be able to increase your productivity and your quality, as an example, right? We know that costs are a big thing. So instead of hiring up, look at how you increase the productivity and the quality of your existing people. Great ask. Use co-pilot, uh, streamline your work, increase your productivity by stretching some of the cognitive load to artificial intelligence or co-pilot and work with you. But do your people, and now I'll work on this triangle around the architect, do your people have the critical analysis skills, as an example? Because it's not about taking the result at face value around what Copilot gives you or the assistance that you put in place gives you. You have to analyze whether the answer is correct or not. You have to be able to be that pragmatic. That's the people. 
On the culture side, you've got to look at the behaviors. Okay, so I'm using an assistant to be able to support me um, in order to increase my productivity, but is my behavior lulling? Am I taking like the approach where I feel comfortable? Am I being complacent? Am I just taking the answer? What is the behavior? How is the behavior is changing um, in the organization that I have to monitor as part of the culture? And then the last piece is around the organizational hardware, which is your systems and your structures. Okay, so what performance metrics do I need to now put in place? How do I measure based on outcomes? Because I've just put something in, I'm testing whether my people, like I'm putting an assistant in, I'm testing whether my people have the competency of critical analysis skills to be able to question the answer that it's giving me. And then what's happening to behavior on the culture? And then how am I measuring that with my performance uh, piece? So just connected that whole triangle together just with one change in the mm -hmm. organization. And then the other part that I'd also say is that there's a balance that um, a CIO needs to be able to hold in terms of their skills is how to innovate, how to operationally run the environment, as well as strategically drive business change all at the same time. So you've got to be a hype filter. Mm -hmm. You have to. I mean, there's hype in everything that we do. You've got to be a hype filter. Especially in tech. Absolutely. So, and then you've got to look at value-based technology initiatives. It's really mm -hmm. important as well as be an integrator all at the same time because it's a complex adaptive system. Mm -hmm. There are multiple systems at play. There's the organization, there's the country, there's the regulator, there's the policy makers, there's your employees. There's so many systems at play at this complex adaptive system that you've got to, how do you actually plan this? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just have to be a catalyst and being a catalyst is enough mm -hmm. and not plan it. Mm -hmm. So that's the other piece. What should be the relationship between the CIO and the rest of the C-suite in the organization, including the CEO? And um, how much of a role do you think the CIO should play in setting organizational strategy? Well, it's a fundamental component around, it's the world is changing and it's centered around technology. It's mm. becoming the driving force of many things. Um, it's changing banking. It's changing banking. It's changing every industry, actually. Um, and I think what's important is that you have a voice in the conversation. Um, but I think there is a role that the CIO needs to play in bringing that holistic view into the table, not just a one-dimensional view of our just technology and the innovation. Mm -hmm. And that means that being part of a C-suite, you have to be interchangeable with one another. So you have to be a risk officer, you have to be a compliance officer, you have to be a CIO, you have to understand the commercials and the revenue side of things. So you have to be able to be interchangeable mm -hmm. and have one conversation. Um, and, and instead of just, I mean, like I'm a technologist and I, I love the fancy new stuff and mm -hmm. dabbling and playing and stuff, but being in, in a bank, which is a systemic bank, yeah. you've got to consider the impact of what you are doing, not just the change and the benefit. You've got to consider everything mm. altogether. I imagine you spend a lot of your time, and uh, when I say you, I mean CIOs generally, spend a, a lot of time educating um, other people in the organization about new technologies and how they could impact the organization for the better. Yes. Do you find that's a, a, bi a big role in, in, in your portfolio? Do you spend a lot of time almost evangelizing about what's coming down the, the line and how this might be able to change things at the bank? So we do do that. I think that our executives are open but there also has to be a, you know, a realist approach to certain things. Mm -hmm. um, if you introduce too much of evangelism in the space, too much of change, what does that provoke? Does it provoke um, an organization that rebels, an organization of anxiety, an organization of um, adaptability? And there's a fine balance between all of that. I don't think that our organization is not open to change. I think with any change comes a process mm. around how do you see it? Where does the value come? How to be able to use it and enroll the people as part of the process? Part of my role is to be able to influence. It's very important. And there's an art to influence as well. Mm -hmm. And it's not about the tell. It's about how do you enroll people as part of that? The evangelizing side of things, I think it's, we hold a lot of context in terms of the technology change that is happening, whether it's in many aspects, um, Web 3.0, or whether it's in new technology, whether it's an artificial intelligence, people are receptive to hear it. But executing on that change doesn't take one individual. It takes multiple individuals. Mm -hmm. So conversations have to happen around what is the value. Um, and that, very importantly, remove the hype.
Mm-hmm. Let's talk a bit about some of the big projects that Investex is um, busy with at the moment to the extent that you're able to, to okay. share information about what, what you're doing. Um, what are some of the what are some of the big IT projects that are on your plate at the moment, and how do those tie in with Investec strategic direction? So we uh, we do a uh, sure um, we uh, we call them key initiatives. We do a lot mm-hmm. in our space. Maybe uh, highlight one or two of them for us. I'll I'll talk um, particularly about one area, and that's um, actually I'll talk about two parts. They're connected to each other. So you will hear one of our leaders, Diren, talk about uh, business transactional banking and increasing our market share there. We started in that business a couple of years ago, and we've seen great progress. Mm-hmm. The mid-market segment is where we're delving into. It's really important for us, and connected. it's connected back to our purpose. So everything's always connected back to our purpose. We see the mid-market segment is drying, driving economic growth, creating jobs. You'll hear him talk about that. So it's really important for us to service that mid-market segment. And in so doing, we looked at a holistic approach in terms of our offering for business transactional banking. Uh, for transactional capability, for FX capability, for lending capability, for um, investment capabilities. How do we ha- offer this holistic offering? I do want to stress that technology doesn't work in isolation of the business. So it's hard for me to just talk about the tech. It's sure. important for me to talk it rolled up into the offering that we want to give our clients. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we keep reminding ourselves we are the business. So as part of that offering, there are certain things that need to be put in place. We want to scale that business. So we've put in payments rails. Mm-hmm. Um, we want to introduce FX um, uh, to that uh, customer base. We've put in FX. Um, and so it, 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 evolves, it involves mus- m- multiple pieces of change to give a holistic offering, which we have done. What we are doing is how do we innovate in that now as an example? How do we scale that even more as our business scales? So talking about cloud technology, we're actually not talking about it, executing on the cloud technology. So our payment rails for PayShap actually is being used here, and that sits in the cloud. So we are leveraging cloud technology already. As an example, we are um, expanding on our API strategy in the business transactional banking space as well. We allow for API connectivity to these mid-sized corporates. Mm-hmm. And we're saying, um, you know what, we notice that you want to create operational efficiency on your side, so rather plug into us using our APIs direct to direct. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, via an API gateway, though. So I don't want to say point-to-point, but via Appam, uh, Microsoft API gateway. So we allow for that connectivity. Um, and then, so we've, we, we've got the APIs, we've got the payments, we've introduced FX. Now, how do we evolve that? How do we scale that? How do we innovate on that? So some of the things I can't share. Sure. Um, but that's a key focus for us in order to increase our market share. Okay. At the same time, I just like to expand on the payments piece. So the payments piece, we know that industry is changing very, very, very fast around us. And I think there's a model that explains that um, we, so with PayShap, with the instant payments, we're live on that with our new rails. Um, and uh, uh, we're doing instant payments. But there's many things that are also changing around that. That's in cloud. It's very important to uh, understand that that allows for the scale, the transactional capability of scale, uh, payments in and out. Um, but there's a piece around uh, payments that specifically talks to a model that talks to how do you adopt, how do you trial, and how do you assess. Mm-hmm. We are in the adopt and trial and not in the assess. So what do I mean by that? Adopt and trial is adopt, we use cloud technology already, we've got open APIs. Um, uh, for us, for our API strategy, we've got secure OPI, uh, open APIs for our clients in the business transactional banking space. We've got a programmable card. It's also um, uh, via APIs. Uh, we've got, uh, and if you don't have a software developer, we've got spreadsheet banking around our API strategy. So we use that as part of our, our strategic offering. Um, and then on the trial pieces, we participate in the blockchain um, mm-hmm. in the industry. So as part of you know, Project Kolka, we actually participate as part of trial using blockchain so that we're ready. But the but the assess piece is not where we're playing. So I know that Bricks Pay, um, an uh, article came out a couple of days ago um, around using blockchain there as well for Bricks uh, mm. countries. Um, now because we're using blockchain already, if that does come, we can participate in it. But we don't play around in CDBCs and there's Gen AI payments, which is not much, much is happening, so I don't know. Gen AI payments. payments. So I was like, okay, but like, what's happening here? Well, nothing's really happening here right now, but that's part of the assess in the okay. future. So we're not playing there. 
we've got to take a risk culture as well. I'm interested in what you say about it, um, opening up APIs for various applications. Is that part of the whole concept of open banking? So what we do is, um, so open banking is part of the PSD2. So we do have, uh, we do fulfill PSD2 in the Sorry, UK. What is that? Um, it's a regulatory framework in order to be able to open up your banking system for fintechs to be able to use. So okay. it's PSD2. Okay. Um, so we allow for that in our UK business. But I want to bring it back home and talk about our API strategy specifically. Yeah. So our API strategy is centered around external as well as on internal on the external side is to be able to connect to our mid-sized corporates and allow them um, API connectivity to be able to pull transactions on real time through their ERP systems. Okay. It creates efficiency mm -hmm. for them as part of their process. So they can just bring in the transactions and do a real time financial reporting as an example. Okay. So we allow that through APIs. So that's part of our business transactional banking offering. Um, and the second part of our external APIs, what we also offer is a programmable card. So um, we believe that technologists are the future segment that's going to drive economic growth and we bank them. But can we give them an offering that makes it exciting? Mm. Um, so we've got a programmable card and we offer that to our, to our client base as well. And we bank those technology professionals. But you can actually program the card. You can say, actually, um, these cards should, because we've also got virtual card, um, should have a limit of 1,000 and you could only shop at Woolworths, as an oh, example. Okay. So you can actually program it. How we've advanced that, because we've got, um, how we're advancing that, uh, also looking at the controls, is that we're experimenting right now with sort of actually more exploring than experimenting, uh, low code, no code. So we've got a low code, no code solution called spreadsheet banking, but I just want to change the topic slightly towards the ability to be able to write the code using uh, um, a GPT assistant that we keep tightened within our rails mm -hmm. um, to be able to write the code and deploy the code for you. So you actually don't need to know how to write the code. So an AI does it for you. Yes. So okay. we're exploring that at the moment. And we, we've got that in our environment to see how you could take and change the game in the API space. Okay. Then we've got the internal APIs because we're an API first uh, bank. Um, and what we do there is we want to be able to secure the connectivity of software systems to our platforms, not point to point, meaning software to software. So we've got these platforms with a number of systems. We want the system to be able to talk to the platform via an API gateway. Mm -hmm. So that's our internal. And that, that wrapping of the APIs in our state allows for a future, possible future, where you could have commodity services that could be monetized, as mm -hmm. an example. Um, so I do believe that there are services in the future in banking that would be probably commoditized. Like, for example? So, like, let's say you want to become a um, market maker on price, as an, uh, a, a, a price maker in the market for FX. Okay. You could offer FX as a commodity service to another bank, to another provider who wants to go uh, use your FX services capabilities, to fintechs out there that wants to use your fintech, uh, uh, use your FX services capabilities. So that becomes a standalone API, and you and um, it's secure, and you could monetize that as well. Mm. We we so. don't yeah we don't monetize anything for uh, right now. Our value is to our clients because mm. that's really important to mm -hmm. us. It's critically important for us. But that commodity service space, I do think, is where banking may go. Um, I know we've got marketplaces uh, with other uh, mm. players in this area already, but we're not a marketplace. Let's return just for a moment to the conversation. To I mean, you've clearly done a lot of work at Investec on AI. Uh, let's do return to the subject just briefly. Um, wh what do you think it's going to mean for ordinary bank customers um, in a couple of years from now? Wh what is AI actually going to bring to the to the party for, for consumers, um, for ordinary investec clients? Client, yeah. <laughs> It's a very interesting question because there's so much every single day about artificial intelligence and how it could change the world. Um, and then on the other side, you read about all the challenges. But if I have to center it around the client and the client experience, I think there's massive value. Look, I, I, I want to take a step back sure. a little bit. Um, because we're talking about artificial intelligence in the sense that it wasn't there and it was always there. We already use predictive and prescriptive modeling already in today's world and I mean we use it in risk management, we use it in you know personalization, we use it in um, suspicious activity monitoring. Many people use it, we already use it in those spaces. Whether it's linear, regression, time series calculations, Monte Carlo simulations, whatever the case, we already use it in the bank and lots of banks already use it. 
But I think where the the game changes are in the fact that Gen AI has democratized artificial intelligence to a point where it's just easy to use it and um, it's predicting new content, new data. Mm -hmm. It's able to consume a lot of the unstructured, like your voice, your text, and bring it all together um, and analyze it in a very fast pace and give you an answer that is highly likely, probably, maybe correct or not. Fact efficient, <laughs> I don't know. You saw it went like a convoluted way there. Um, because we don't know sometimes whether it's fact efficient yeah. or fiction because it sounds it so real, mm. 100%. Mm. It sounds so real. But, and I think I want to hone in on the gen AI piece mm -hmm. rather than the predictive and the prescriptive model side of things. Uh, because that is going to continue. Um, but what I'd like to focus on as a generative AI, I think client experiences will change. I think the mechanisms in which you interact with your app or online or anything will all change from mm -hmm. a client experience perspective. That will be one of the fundamental. You can, I mean, I'll just talk to my Apple Watch and just tell mm -hmm. it, please, can you pay someone as an example? Um, but they've got to be certain controls in place. Um, in order for that to, to work functionally correct. Yeah. Um, these models have risk in itself. And I know there's lots of databases, like there's an MIT database, et cetera, with the models and the risks that it has with itself. And we've got to be very cognizant of those model risks. Mm -hmm. It's also not trained yet as well. We've got to train it. I mean, Benjamin Rosman spoke to us recently about training these models um, you know, and many conversations I hear about African data being trained in these models and what do they mean, understanding the context, etc. But I think from a client experience perspective, it is going to change. I think on um, a fraud is another key thing that the client is going to benefit from mm -hmm. because fraud is on an uprise um, because this technology is actually being used because it's democratized to be able to create more fraud. Mm. And what's happening is because the industry is changing so fast as well, you've got um, multiple interaction points that the client faces the bank. You've got the app, you've got web, you've got on uh, app, web, which is online. You've got APIs now is our channel. You've got the bank, you've got the bankers, you've got the support center, you've got different modalities. You've got voice, you've got text, you've got many things, mm -hmm. right? And then you've, you've got all these interaction points, different modalities or different channels, different modalities. And then you've got different, let's take payments as an example. You'll have EFT, you'll have card, you have digital payments, whatever that landscape changes to and it'll keep evolving. What GenAI can do is it can bring all of those modalities, all of those channels and all of those payment capabilities together to find patterns in your fraud. Mm -hmm. So... It changes the game completely from a fraud perspective. Um, we There's a Ghana analyst, uh, Pete Redshaw, talks about Reg 2.0. And he said it's an un, uh, like regulatory technologies and it's it's sort of like forgotten on the wayside. And actually it should, uh, like I strongly agree with him that it should be on the front of your mind right now on how you enhance the regulatory technology. So from a client benefit perspective, whilst you're dealing with fraud, it helps the client indirectly. Because you're dealing with someone's wealth. It's the hard, uh, hard earned money. You have to protect it. You That's have to number one responsibility. At the end of the client day. expects trust. Yeah. The regulator expects a risk culture. The client expects trust. So client experience, fraud. Um, I mean, it can even predict. It'll probably at some point predict which new channels you need to introduce in your environment. Mm. Mm. It's the newness about it. It's the new data. Mm. It's the new patterns. It's all of that that benefits you. You had me at talking to, talking to my watch. <laughs> <laughs> Pay Shabana a thousand rand. Yes. That does it. Yes. <laughs> so, look, the, the, it's going to be very, I think the, the future, so I, have a, I have a view that the future of banking is going to be, I mean, at Investec, we pride ourselves in our relationships. It's absolutely critical to us. Mm -hmm. I need to know who Duncan is. Um, we, we, it is. We can't lose that. And we won't lose that. So I believe that we'll integrate the relationship with the digitally powered. It's an integration. It's not, it's not mutually exclusive. Mm. It's reinforcing, actually. And experiences will feel that way. So I will know more using the power of uh, co-intelligence to be able to understand my client better 
not to give them new products, mm-hmm. but to understand their need and offer what they need. And make it more convenient. And make it more convenient. So the convenience will change. The engagement will change. Um, it, it'll just be at a whole new level, mm-hmm. actually. The experience will change. I mean, we talk about hyper-personalization. Well, what's it going to look like for consumers, though? Is it going to be a chatbot that you interact with? Is it, uh, <laughs> is it just going to be a seamless experience? I think you'll always have... So with an integrated experience, mm-hmm. you'll always have the human in that relationship. Um, and I envision an experience, and it's very like it, it might be too far-fetched, it might not be, maybe it's already happening, I don't know. But I think that um, you, you'll probably know more about the client and when he needs to do some, he or she needs to do something before the client mm. knows when he or she mm. needs to do something. Mm-hmm. I'm submitting my tax forms. I can already submit it on your behalf. I'll know the sub, the, the SARS deadline. I know you own a corporate. I know you're an individual. I know the deadlines. I've done your tax forms for you. I can notice that on an individual basis, you know, you, you need to put more in your, I don't know, your pension or whatever mm-hmm. the case is, your provident funds, because you're spending on too much of tax. Let me do it. Let me suggest all of these things. Mm. I was like, that would be an amazing mm. world. That would be cool. Very that would cool. Be cool. How is AI going to um, impact uh, productivity uh, in the bank? And wh- what does it also mean for jobs? Whew, um I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use what I said earlier around the fact that we as technologists or CIOs also have to consider the context of the country that you operate in. I know our unemployment is sitting at 33.5%. And I know that the rest of the world, and I think it's in one of the books that I read about, I forgot the author, it escapes me right now, but he talks about the next decade and how Africa is the only growing population. Mm-hmm. Um, but the rest of the world is dwindling on population. So if you look at the rest of the world, AI will benefit them because they have a dwindling population. Mm. So mm. you'd have a different experience. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But then if you look at the context of South Africa and that 33.5% of unemployment rate, like what should we be doing there knowing that the future skill set is centered around artificial intelligence or in cloud engineering as an example? Um, like what are the things that we need to consider on that base? But I think from a productivity, that's a skills piece of it. But from a productivity perspective, I think, you know, Ethan Mollock talks about the fact that we're going to live in a co-intelligent world. Um, and the reality is that uh, there's, a, there's a deep focus using collective intelligence to increase your productivity and your quality distribution curves. And it's all about how do you use the assistance? How do you use the co-pilots? And you still have to, you have a role to still play in using that technology though. So I can have an assistant that be able, that's reading all the policies that are going to come out because we're going to have more and more regular policies coming out because of technology change changing so fast. To be able to understand all the policies, give me a summary of the policies and tell me what I need to do. But I still, like I still need to understand it. Like it doesn't Mm. mean I'm just going to accept it at face value. I'm Mm -hmm. still going to be able to critically analyze what it gives me. I'd use the same example for coding as well. I mean, there's Devon, right? So I don't know if you know about Devon, but Devon can code for you, right? Mm -hmm. So it's an assistant that codes for you. And um, similarly, you can use GitHub Copilot to be able to code for you as well. But are we going to lose the fundamentals of what I learned as an example in object-oriented programming? Like, will I just accept the code that it gives me? Or will I have to understand the code that is given me that it doesn't have any security loopholes mm. in order to put it in play? What does maintenance of that code base mean going for that, indiv- uh, for that individual that is using Copilot? Uh, so those are things you have to consider. Mm. So your role is changing. Absolutely, it is going to be integrated into everything that we are doing. I agree with that. The assistants, the co-pilots. However, whatever term we use on it, it's going to be integrated how your role changes is going to change. But it also is, and like, what's the measure of productivity here? How do we measure? And it's a bit like, I'm like, okay, where do I sit on this? How do I measure the productivity? Is it time um, it's taken to code or time it's taken to code, to analyze, to test, as well as put it into the environment and to maintain that? Like my understanding, I still have to understand what code I'm putting in. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's so many aspects, but, you know, you could use it for coding, you could use it for, understanding policies, you could use it for, I mean, I'll give you a, I'll give you a perfect example. We went to South African 
uh, voting. Mm -hmm. What we did was, um, and it was, you know, because of the hallucination, we needed to tighten it, so we only kept it to our staff. What we did was, uh, we've got Zebra GPT in our environment, so we took the um, a GPT model from, or, or from Microsoft and we actually put it in our own rails and we tightened it to ourselves because it's secure, we're a bank, we don't want leakage of information, we want a controlled environment. And our philosophy is very important. It's centered around the fact that you want to explore, experiment, and exploit. So you have a bunch of hypotheses, you want to be able to come up with them, you want to experiment and prove the hypotheses, whichever one, and then you want to exploit the one that you know is going to add you value. So what we did was, we took the, um, and I'll, it's, a, it's a more of a pragmatic example, So because uh, we're doing a lot of experimentation. Um, we took the manifestos, yeah, and we put it into Zebra GPT. And um, we contained it and we called it a voting assistant. Mm -hmm. And we gave it to our staff and we tightened it. So we gave it a role. Uh, we said, you, you can't stretch out into, you've got to keep within your own rails. Mm -hmm. um, and there's terms and conditions of using it. But with the objective for our staff to be able to understand the manifestos and compare the manifestos across political parties. Fascinating. That's just to understand it. Mm -hmm. That's all. But it's still an employee or well, staff's responsibility to be able to understand what it means and to say, okay, have, they, have these parties really executed on them, as mm. an example? Mm. So it's not detracting from their responsibility. It's just sort of creating a platform for them to be able to consume information mm -hmm. in a very different way than going through hundreds of pages of documents. Asking yeah. questions, yeah. as simple as that. Yes. Um, and, and um, that's what we did as an example. We're talking about very advanced technologies here, um, but I, I think I must bring it back, the conversation back a little bit because banks, and I don't, I don't know what your technology stack looks like, maybe you can, you can uh, okay. give us a brief overview of this, but I know banks tend to have a lot of legacy um, systems. A lot of banks here are still running mainframes. They're, they're hiring COBOL, they hire COBOL developers. There's a, there's a lot of legacy there. There's a lot of middleware to try and get the, yes. that legacy to talk to these new applications like AI, for example. Um, I d I, but I don't have insight into, into Investec. What does your technology stack look like? Uh, and how does it compare to other banks in South Africa? And then maybe allied to that, maybe talk a bit about, you've mentioned you've, you've moved somewhat to the cloud. Maybe just give us some um, context to that and um, w your views of cloud computing and what you're doing in that space. Okay. So I think it's easier for me to be able to explain uh, the tech stack uh, in uh, maybe in a different way. So we've got a regulatory tech stack. Mm -hmm. So our our capital, our compliance, our risks, so our balance sheet risk systems, etc. Um, we've got um, enterprise shared platforms that's actually used across the bank as well. So um, uh, for example, our payments uh, payments rails. Um, our client, our data, our integration stack. Then we've got the stack that actually what we call, um, what I call the financial value stack. So basically the product, so where the products actually sit. So we've got that stack. So your treasury, your trading, your lending, um, uh, portfolios, um, your transactional capabilities, um, like our card systems, um, our cash investments and treasury systems, um, all of those, and then we've got the channels, mm -hmm. which is our APIs, our app, our web, and our client servicing center technology as well, because we've got vo voice biometrics as an example in our stack, which we, for our, for our client support center, as well as many other technologies that our CSE uses and our bankers actually use as well. So, I mean, if I have to explain the stacks that how it works, but your question around legacy, mm. our preference is not to call it legacy, okay. because it was fit for purpose before, and it's now not for fit for purpose. Um, so there are things that you have to modernize as part of the approach. As your business evolves, as the technology evolves, so do you need to evolve that base. Mm -hmm. And we have a view around our vision statement, um, which is basically to create a personalized client experience and digitalize, and scalable business by digitalizing our DNA. It is really important, that, st that statement, mm -hmm. because that is linked to our strategic objectives. And um, what we do is we look at what are the components we need to change in order to drive the scale? What are the components we need to change in order to make strategic use of data? 
What are the components that we need to take uh, to change in order to get speed of execution? What are the components we need to change in order to drive towards the growth mindset of our business as well as manage the cost discipline in terms of our strategic objectives, as well as share across geographies together with sharing across business areas? So our preference is not to say that there's legacy and we heavy weighted on legacy, but what are the things that we need to change? And is it incremental or is it exponential? And what are the risks if it's incre incremental or exponential? Mm -hmm. Or is there a middle ground? And how do we accelerate some of these pieces as well? So, uh, and look, do you want me to answer the cloud question? Please do, yes. So, so I mean, let's just take a step back in terms of our uh, approach. And I'll go back to that vision statement around creating a personalized client experience and scalable business by digitalizing our DNA. Mm -hmm. What we, I'll speak about four things in terms of our approach as being a functional area being technology, as well as a federated area being horizontal across business areas. Uh, because there's two key things here, functional approach, which is embedded in each of the business areas uh, as part of the horizontal, but also each of the divisional areas also want to drive their own growth strategies that meet the six strategic objectives of our bank. So there's, it feels like a matrix. Let's talk about the functional area. So in technology, I'll talk about four things. That client experience is absolutely critical for us. The end game is to make sure that it's slick, it's intimate, and it's out of the ordinary, actually. It's personalized mm -hmm. because it's who we are. Um, and we'll use data to be able to do that. It's very important, which we've already done. And that's where the predictive and the prescriptive side comes in. The second piece is our cloud journey. And I'll spend a couple of moments there. Because our cloud journey is we've got a software as a service strategy. Um, we got a platform as a service strategy. And it's critical and vital for us to enable, enable the scalability of our organization to get the pace that we want to need, the elasticity that we want to need, that we need to be able to you know, use the modern technology in order to be able to enable the business of, the, uh, of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But what we've done is in our PaaS journey, maybe I should start off by saying our principle is the following. What is commodity we will lease? What is um, uh, differentiating we will build? Our client experience is differentiating, so we will build. Mm -hmm. that is our, that's key to our strategy. So what we've done in the cloud space is, specifically is we've integrated in our past journey our modernization piece as well. Deloitte talks about the integration um, of the of cloud and modernization to take care to t to modernize your state or your foundation at the same time take advantage of your scale opportunities. So we've done that. Now it could feel so. Basically, what that means is that we've got some of these systems might be monolithic, so they we're trying to drive towards a composable architecture. Mm -hmm. So very distributed architecture. So these monolithic applications need to be smaller pieces so that you can rent and assemble and plug and play. That's the, that, that's the gist of it. It's as right. simple as that. Mm -hmm. So that work is being done with the cloud work at the same time. So we're building in our past journey in that way. It doesn't mean it's a fixed strategy, though, from a, from a cloud perspective. We will continuously look at how do we accelerate that cloud journey. Um, and there'll be different mechanisms of doing that. Um, but the end game, scale, user experience, um, uh, enabling the growth of the business of tomorrow while still maintaining a risk culture. Because I think there is an aspect around cost and the CapEx becomes very real um, in the OPEX side. So mm -hmm. it's in your face yes. now. Uh, so something that sat on the balance sheet before and sweat the asset over three to five years is now very much in your face. So we've got to continuously learn as part of this approach. Because there are standards that are changing. It's a mindset change. It's the way code changes, all of that. Mm. But there are other mechanisms that we will explore to accelerate cloud specifically. The other two things was the API. I think I've referred to that, the internal strategy and the external strategy. And you mentioned that people actually are talking about AI and introduction of AI. But like there's an uh, I see cup, uh, Gen A. So the open AI API uh, endpoints can now be um, put into an API gateway which okay. is exactly what we want so that people can interact with those APIs via a gateway. So mm -hmm. it's secure because sometimes you don't know where authorization and authentication is actually happening mm -hmm. and you need a control mechanism as part of it. So those APIs living in APM, sorry, APIM, um, uh, it's APM, I think you know what I mean, mm -hmm. um, actually gives us that control environment and governance that we need. 
So we've got the internal, we have the external, and then the last piece is around the data piece. Now it's really important for us, when we sat down, we said, well, if our architecture is moving from, from this monolithic to quite distributed, why is our data still thinking about the same methodology of it being data warehouse, massive data warehouses or data, massive data lakes? Um, there's a Martin Fowler article that we refer to that talks about distributed data mesh. Um, we use that in mm -hmm. our space. So it's actually building a water garden, small, smaller data lakes, but ultimately building a data product at the end of the day. Uh, so fraud can become a data product, as an example. And how do you reuse this water garden of data lakes in order to be able to build up the data products? Mm. Um, so the, and we want to create this distribution um, of data. So we call, and it's called Manfalo calls it the dis, uh, distributed data mesh. Mm. That's it's four things. I have some change. reading to do. <laughs> <laughs> So, Anna, it would be uh, remiss of me not to uh, conclude the conversation by asking you a bit about um, cybersecurity because that is top of mind across industries, but uh, in, in financial services, I think it's a particular focus area. Is, is that something that's looked after by someone else in the C-suite or does it fall under your portfolio? So, we have a CISO mm -hmm. um, and uh, he's a top notch. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, it's really important that you get the best of the best in your organization to manage security. And it's not just on cybersecurity. So, so it's uh, it's the, both the insider threat as well as the external threat. So when we look at security, it's both inside and external. And um, underneath, he's got ISO, so information security officers, pen testers. So that model works in that way, and many other uh, other people underneath him. So he actually looks after the practice. Mm -hmm. I don't look after it. But it's important for me as the CIO to understand the sec dev ops. Yes. Um, pieces. Yes. Because we have to think security first now, not a DevSecOps kind of approach. So we're always constantly thinking about security. And, you In know... new product development as well, absolutely. I imagine. Absolutely. must be critical. Ab deep fakes. So it's very real. Mm -hmm. Very real. And that's advancing too as well because of generative AI. And I don't know if you saw Worm GPT, no. but like Worm GPT can write an email like it's so real mm. as an example. So you've got like he's like on top of his game, needs to be able to understand what is happening in industry. There's synthetic IDs now. It takes a real ID and it takes a fake ID and it creates a new ID that is a new person that will be on board that could be onboarded as an as an individual in a system to open up an account. Mm. How would we ever know that it's actually a fake um, ID as an example? So, like, these advancements are so fast. I mean, even with voice biometrics, you've got deep fakes there as well. What's real and what's not? Mm. There are mechanisms to analyze all of that. So, our CISO, look, he's, he's pretty amazing. He sits independently. He sits at a group level. He's got to look after the UK as well as South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he's, yeah, I mean, you should talk to him, actually. Mm -hmm. he's, he's a good storyteller. <laughs> okay, good. We'll get him on the show at some point. <laughs> <laughs> sounds, sounds good. Um, one of the, the challenges that organizations are facing, though, is finding security skills. I mean, it's not only security, it's, it's across the board in IT, but security is particularly impacted. How does um, Investec and, uh, attract and retain the best talent? How do you, go, how do you approach that? I would say, um, some people may say it's a cheesy answer, but it's our culture, actually, okay. um, is our retention mechanism. I do think there are multiple mechanisms across technology as a whole, though. So it's being able to look at it uh, because it's not only to service Investec, but it's to service the economy of South Africa and bring us as a hub to be able to become attractive talent to the world, mm -hmm. as an example. So at a school level, what are we doing? Um, and we go into schools. Uh, we also focus on the foundational element of technology skills, which is mathematics. We believe that mathematics is critical for any role, actually, not just for technology. But um, remember when I started, uh, my computer science teacher spoke to me and spoke to us and said, like you, like, you guys are good in mathematics. Why don't you do computer science? Mm -hmm. It's new, et cetera. So we focus on those foundational skills around mathematics, very, very important at school level. We focus around exposing students to, um, in our tech dev, um, sorry, our tech talent days in mm -hmm. order to understand what technology could do for them, what a career could mean for them, to be able to create, you know, this inspirational curiosity, if you want to call it, around technology. Then at a university level, what we do is we have career days as well. We have um, uh, uh, learnership programs. We have uh, graduate programs, all at that level as well. 
And then within the organization, it's about the retention. Now we've created all of this talent. We bring them in. It's about retention. It's also about taking the learnership, giving them commercial experiencing experiences, put them back into the industry. It's, it's growing this economy more and more. In terms of our diversity, inclusion and belonging, it is central to our culture. It's part of our value system. It's critically important to us. So Mantra Goshal talks about discipline, trust, um, support and stretch. Those four things are fundamental to our culture. Mm-hmm. It's how we build people, how we grow people, how we don't have over-the-wall syndrome um, kind of aspects in what we do. You become well-rounded, you get exposed. That's probably the reason why I'm still there for 16 years because <laughs> I learn every day. And it feels like a stretch. Yeah. I feel the growth. I'm not on adrenaline all the time, but when it's like, when I am, it's like you're in the zone mm-hmm. and you get exposure to everything, actually. So um, it's to be able to build at the systemic pieces, so in the beginning of the chain, and it's being able to retain, very much centered around a culture. And we're a work-hard culture, mm-hmm. but also a very motivational, play-hard culture as well. Okay. So we're going to inspire you. It's, it's yeah. what we do. Yeah. And yes. if you want to be in, in, in tech at the cutting edge, it sounds like Investec is the place to be. Absolutely, yes. You're doing a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of stuff I haven't even heard about before. <laughs> so uh, fascinating conversation. Uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for coming into our studio and, and, and sharing some insight into, into what's happening at Investec from an IT perspective. Uh, Shabana Thaver is Chief Information Officer at Investec Specialist Bank. Thanks so much for being a guest on our show. Thank you very much, Duncan. It was awesome. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>